Alright, hello there, and welcome to Garden Philosophy. This is a segment where we will talk about deep issues that concern gardening, economy, ecology. Now why would we ever put toxic chemicals onto our food supply? seems like a counterintuitive thing to do, but we'll understand in this video that there are economic drivers as well as ecological constraints that cause this to happen. Now starting with the economics, simple. Capitalist economics resides on the principle of economy of scale. That means that you have to increase production to lower production costs. So the bigger area you can plant of one single crop, the more likely you'll be to get a bigger yield that can easily be harvested and then distributed. And all those things done together in its scale is what drives down the price of production. Now, there are some ecological constraints to that. Monoculture is another issue that is an ecological constraint, we have to fight it all the time. We want to have monocultures because they are more profitable in a reductionist way of thinking, but they do not work with nature. Nature is always fighting it. The thing is, nature abhors monocultures. You rarely find monocultures in nature. There are really, really complex symbiotic relationships of several organisms and they build communities. Whenever you have a monoculture, you're gonna have monocultures of pests. It just booms and then collapses. Whereas a mixed type of um, agriculture will create barriers, physical barriers, for certain pests to go from one crop to the other so that it kinda makes things not be in one basket. So if you break some eggs, you're not breaking everything. Because we live in a society and we are of a Cartesian way of thinking that everything can be reduced to its elements and still be significant, we reduced economic growth or prosperity to driving the output of one single species that has direct benefits to us and we forget everything else. Now, you may think, well, how else could we think differently, you know? The reality is, we do not input into our calculation things like clean air, clean food, clean water, biodiversity. Those are things that, although they can incur either costs or actually be assets, they are not input, they're not put into the calculation so that when chemicals start to get into the food supply and people get sick, the cost of being sick is not directly put on the producer of the food, it's a liability that the person will have to deal with. No wonder we live in a health crisis because it's a system, although it works in short term and it does show growth, it has some issues that unless we're able to deal with them in a mature way, we'll see this deteriorating. There is another reason why companies prefer to use chemical solutions for agricultural problems, and that is because chemicals, they can be patented. So they become intellectual property of the company at first, and they can also be produced cheaply and then charged a surcharge. So there's a lot of profit in that. Whereas organic solutions, many times they cannot be patented because they're natural and there's no economic driver to spread that idea. Fortunately, we live in an era where information can be easily spreadable and we do not need to only hear what the big companies are trying to sell us. We can search online and find new solutions and we can look into research that's being done on organic solutions. Now granted, chemicals many times 
can be more effective at killing things and so a pesticide will appear more effective that doesn't mean it's better overall because again we're not inputting the negative aspects into the equation if we were to equate to put into the equation the devastation that lack of biodiversity can cause or will cause eventually to ecosystems and how ecosystems and how these eco and how these ecosystems they can produce naturally clean water clean air which benefits human life which creates growth and demand and how that cycle actually would help economic growth in a long stable long-term stable way if we did that we would be in a much better situation but we're only interested in short-term quarter earnings I received a comment in the last question and answer videos where I was actually talking about herbicide use in hay and I thought it resonated so I'd like to share with you and it actually comes from Ray Wharton and he writes Herbicide contamination is rising to be one of the most important issues for gardeners. In my group of friends, I can think of five gardens which got wasted by manure. Milestone is the number one culprit in my area. Lots of hay farmers around here, and all the money is in the biz of horse hay. Mostly for horses, which don't do anything but decorate a lawn. Holding back the, the glue industry in my book. <laughs> Anyways, folks want the pure grass hay for horses, and Bob's your uncle, the whole region starts spraying. Every herbivore in the area either eats contaminated hay on the regular, or if they don't, you cannot tell if they might have, say, a farmer was shorted some bales and borrowed from a neighbor. The whole technique of farming I favor is focused on making use of compost, being in a rural area that should work great. Sadly. Most manure and waste hay is contaminated, and the other farmers I work with won't take the risk of using compost from off-site anymore. Even if a manure source has a good track record, really nothing else makes me more upset these days. I am looking for a way to make a difference in my community, but would like for there to be a brighter spotlight on the issue, so thanks for discussing it. And at the moment, I am trying to get a list of uncontaminated hay and manure sources in my area. A list of gardeners who would pay or deal for good compost or mulch. And to educate the horse keepers in the area on the issue. It's a terrible thing that something that used to be an asset, an economic asset, you read about things from the 1800s, and not to say that everything from the 1800s is good. That's called a fallacy. It's an appeal to history or just customs, not necessarily because it's old, it's good. Hay and compost used to be an asset for gardeners. You read about the market gardens of Paris and how much they relied on horse manure to heat up, make hotbeds and fertilize the soil and they were able to produce a lot of the produce or almost perhaps 90 percent of the produce that Paris needed on the outskirts of Paris that was sustainability why not because they were trying to be sustainable that was far from their idea they had ecological or economic or technological constraints that prevented them from doing otherwise we've opened Pandora's box with synthetic chemicals and they're powerful they obviously work to an extent, but do we understand how they work synergistically with everything else? We need to ask that question. Why do companies seek chemicals? First, they work, they're strong, they're harsh. Because they're harsh, they can have detrimental effects. Sometimes pesticides and herbicides are... They are what we call persistent. They will re be in the soil and the environment for generations. In this case, with the, the hay, that's what's happening. There is persistent herbicide that is a broadleaf herbicide. It will kill everything that's not a grass and it will stay there. And that's why once you put the compost, 
the uh, of the the horse that ate the hay into your garden the garden starts to die everything else that's not a grass dies or doesn't grow properly considering that we've turned something that was an asset a highly um, nutrient dense source which is horse manure into a toxic waste that nobody wants hearing his experience something that I had heard about a little bit but I have I hadn't I, I, I read um, articles I saw that this was happening but I had not heard something from a first person perspective and hearing his account really drove home the concept that we need to square these things out and what he's doing he is doing the right thing he's not depending on government to change he is taking the initiative to do what he can to try to compile a list to try to grow a movement that's how we move positive positively we have to set the example if we want to live healthier lives if we want to have a more sane economy that has some aspects of justice input into it we need to, to do what we can to do our part so you may ask what's the way forward the way forward is gonna happen when it happens I cannot tell you exactly how it's gonna be but we can see different strategies that can be used and I think our friend Ray he is doing a great thing by taking initiative and in trying to solve the issue for his local community the the stronger we make local the local spheres in terms of community economy the the better and more resilient system we're gonna have now do I have a per perfect system in mind not necessarily I think that's where our thinking needs to come together and we need to actually dialogue and not just throw tantrums at each other and talk in terms of actual logic and actual arguments. If we do not input clean water, for example, into the economic equation, somebody will have to pick that up. Now, many times bad things are seen as good economic indexes. They go and count into the GDP. War can count, or expenditure with war or military is counted towards the GDP and unfortunately a huge byproduct of war is casualties and, and death that's not positive and so on and so forth now if we think that the only reason why we make a, a, a certain decision on a topic is just out of the simple economic market-based or short-term market-based um, principle we are heading in a really dangerous direction now there are as I said there are ecological constraints there are technological constraints or economic constraints that make things be what they are however our biggest constraint is the constraint of the mind and while we bicker while we become partisan while we pick sides for no reason other than because we like, because others like, when we don't question the real arguments and we're not open to understand the issue and we start to call people tree huggers because they understand the environment is a huge economical asset, then we muddy the waters of conversation, we muddy the neurons in our brains, we're not able to move forward. So this is a call for you to research more, understand more, be compassionate, understanding the other side, understand that your side is not always right, understand the arguments as much as you can, be humble, be open, be aware. Thank you.